Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to start out by thanking all of our viewers and welcome you all to Medical Student Grand Rounds. My name is Bryce Ringwall. I'm a fourth year medical student and vice president of student council. Medical Student Grand Rounds is a lecture series uh, given to inspiring, uh, given by inspiring med students. And this series occurs the first and third Tuesday of the month, um, starting at 12 p.m. and is conducted uh, via Zoom. Uh, we'll probably continue doing that through the rest of our, um, our year. Um, we're currently in the middle of Women's History Month. Uh, in our next two talks, they're gonna be centered around uh, women's health. Uh, today, we have a fantastic presentation lined up for you all. Kate Walsh is gonna be presenting on uh, natural uh, family planning methods and how modern techniques have increased their effectiveness. And then on April 6th, uh, we're going to have Shannon Weber uh, discuss how she created a women's health specialty clinic uh, within the Columbus Free Clinic Services uh, to provide specialty women's care for these individuals. We also wanted to make you all aware of our YouTube channel as well, uh, where you can view all of our past presentations. Uh, to do this, you know, you can log on to YouTube, uh, search Medical Student Grand Rounds, and be sure to subscribe to our page to get updates on when new lectures are posted. And during this talk, we're gonna be utilizing the Q&A function uh, for questions at the end. So that can be found at the bottom of your screen there. And throughout, feel free to put in your questions and we'll get to them, um, hopefully all of them, uh, by the end of the session. Uh, and now without further ado, it is my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Parker, who is a current uh, Mount Carmel OBGYN uh, for today's introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Michael Parker, the current president of the Catholic Medical Association and a proud 1989 graduate of the Ohio State University College of Medicine where I also completed my residency in obstetrics and gynecology. It's my extreme pleasure to introduce to you today, Caitlin Welsh. Uh, Caitlin is somebody I've known personally uh, through work with her in volunteer situations at the Order of Malta Center of Care, but also through her student activities as a member of the Catholic Medical Association student section. Caitlin grew up in Pittsburgh and attended Notre Dame University in South Bend where she graduated cum laude in 2017. Here at Ohio State University, she has been the FMIG president, is currently serving as student trustee on board of the Ohio Academy, on the board of the Ohio Academy of Family Physician Foundation. And again, is one of the leaders of the Ohio State University Catholic Medical Association student section. Caitlin's talk today, I think, is very important because it offers an alternative approach to the management of women's gynecologic care. I know this from direct experience as I myself practiced here in the Columbus area for 15 years using fertility awareness based method to treat multiple gynecologic problems, including infertility, endometriosis, ovarian cyst, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and premenstrual symptoms. It's an interesting and unique way to use the physiology of a woman's body uh, to work in a cooperative fashion with her uh, body to restore herself back to health. It empowers women to make decisions about their fertility and about their health care. It gives them greater knowledge about how their body works and functions. It allows them to take responsibility for their future. I think you'll find today's talk very interesting. I encourage all of you to learn more about fertility awareness-based methods of uh, fertility because there is a growing interest in this method, especially among people who wish to stay away from chemical uh, contraception, but also devices that are implanted in the body as they feel it's not so natural. But I think if we're going to be able to provide comprehensive women's health care in all realms, we need to have a basic understanding of fertility awareness-based methods and so that when you have patients who come into your office who are using these methods and you'd like you to help them with difficulties they may be having from a medical perspective, whether you're a family medicine doctor or an obstetrician gynecologist or a pediatrician, uh, any of these may present to your office. And I think it's important that you have a basic understanding. 
I think uh, during today's talk by Caitlin, um, if you have any questions, she can give you my contact information. I'd be happy to discuss with you about how I use fertility awareness-based methods within my gynecologic practice for over 15 years. I had a very successful and thriving practice in Guyana. It's been a pleasure to introduce Caitlin Walsh to you today. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Kate Walsh. Um, I want to thank Dr. Parker for sending in that video to introduce me today. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Alicia Thompson, who's on this call today. She is also an OBGYN. She practices in Westerville, and she's familiar with uh, modern day fertility awareness based methods and uses them in her practice as well. And she's here to, um, she's helped me with this presentation and is here to help uh, with any questions people have at the end. Um, so I'm an M4, I'm going into family medicine, and this is a topic that I've spent a lot of time learning about over um, my medical school career, and I'm hopeful to continue to learn more about um, research and practice in the future as a family medicine doctor. Um, so just to start, what are FABMs, or fertility awareness-based methods? Um, in kind of jest here, I say, not your grandma's NFP, um, and you know, with a laugh. Um, I think there's so many terms that go along with this field, NFP, natural family planning, fertility awareness, the rhythm method, the calendar method, a lot of these things that people might have heard about but don't have a clear picture of what it all means. And so I'm here today to hopefully give an introduction to this topic um, and just teach you all a little bit more about it. What's, what's up to date? What is the current research? Um, what does it mean for women's health? What does it mean for family planning? Um, and so to start, I wanna just define some terms, um, just you know, kind of 30,000 feet overview of fertility awareness versus natural family planning. Um, as you'll see throughout my presentation, I'm going to use both of these terms um, and the abbreviations for them. Um, and I'm gonna probably use them mostly interchangeably. A lot of the studies that I cite in this presentation use both terms. Um, for most people's purposes, they are sort of the same thing. Um, here, I'll just give some basic definitions. So fertility awareness is the broader umbrella. Um, these methods of family planning rely on a woman's understanding and recognition of her fertility. FABMs provide couples with the information they need to identify the days in each cycle when the woman is likely to conceive. Couples can then use this information to guide their family planning decisions. NFP is a more, um, more of a subset of fertility awareness-based methods where couples completely refrain from any genital contact or any sexual intercourse during the fertile days if they are seeking to avoid pregnancy. And then conversely, they engage in sexual intercourse during the fertile days to achieve pregnancy if that is their family planning intention. Um, some modern methods of FABMs do allow um, sexual intercourse and using barrier methods during the times of fertility. So. That's like a basic difference between the two. But again, for the purposes of this talk, I wouldn't get too caught up in the details. Um, I'm gonna be using the terms interchangeably. Um, so why did I want to share this Grand Rounds with you all? Um, I've just found, you know, I found through my own personal experience, but also through the research, as I'll talk about, there's really a scarcity of information about FABMs presented to medical professional students and even um, physicians in residency. Um, even more, you know, what is presented often is inaccurate and incomplete, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, additionally, especially for those of us who are going into primary care, really just being able to have a basic knowledge of a woman's physiology and her fertility is very important. And as physicians, again, if, especially if we're going into primary care, we owe it to the women we treat to be able to explain this to them. Um, and then again, uh, women are interested in learning about these methods. Um, there's a study done in 1998, surveyed over 1,200 women. Uh, only 4% of them had been using NFP prior to um, the study, but after a very brief explanation of um, NFP, almost half said they were interested in using it. Um, another study was done in the United States that, again, after a brief explanation of modern day methods of fertility awareness, um, one fifth said that they were likely to use, likely or very likely to use it to avoid pregnancy. And even more said they were likely or very likely to use it to achieve pregnancy. Um, 
these studies looked in and asked, you know, women, okay, so if you're interested, what is appealing about NFP to you? Um, just 3.3%, which I thought was interesting, referred to any sort of religious or moral acceptability of NFP. The other uh, more widely cited reasons were, you know, it being natural, having no side effects, a low cost associated, knowing that these methods are reliable and effective, and just helping a woman understand her own body. Um, and so I, you know, these, um, this is, you know, proof in, in the literature of what women are seeking and what they want and how they feel after just given being given a little bit of information about these methods. Um, it's interesting, some of my mentors in the field who are now some, you know, very uh, big proponents and users and practitioners of these methods um, became physicians, were in residency before they even knew about these methods. And some of them are female and were really surprised to hear about them um, and they often just heard about them from like one person who in their residency program who brought it up. So my goal today with this Grand Rounds is maybe, you know, I could be that person for some of you. If you've never heard of these methods or really don't know much about them, don't know much of the modern information, I would love to be the first person who um, shares kind of that background with you and piques your interest um, and maybe opens the door to learning more um, about how to incorporate these methods into just comprehensive women's health care. Um, Going on that point, you know, a 2012, a recent survey just in 2012 of 120 family medicine re residency programs um, showed that over half of the women's health faculty in these programs were not familiar with modern methods, and a quarter of the programs don't include FABMs at all in their women's health curriculum. Um, so, you know, how can we expect physicians to be able to offer the, this knowledge and offer these programs to women if they're just not being taught about them in medical schools and in residencies? Um, and that you know, brings me to this concept of informed consent. Um, we learn about this in medical school, how important informed consent is, no matter what, whether it's a con contraception dis uh, discussion or a procedure, um, you know, being able to provide a patient with honest evidence-based information about the risks, benefits, and side effects of whatever we're offering them, and then allowing the patient to say for themselves, yes, I agree to this, or I desire this, or I don't desire this, is so important to patient autonomy and good patient care. Um, this is a huge, you know, hot button topic in the world of women's health and contraceptive options. This is a chart from the CDC. This is the most updated on their website. Um, it actually looks a little bit different from the chart I learned when I was an M1, um, but they, so they have updated it a little bit, um, but even just from looking at this image, you know, women have so many options when it comes to family planning and contraception. Um, and so I, you know, down here you can see fertility awareness-based methods. This is actually a change, and I would say an improvement from the older charts. Um, not only they used to just have the calendar, but now they actually have this little hand um, looking at cervical mucus. They have a thermometer for basal body temperature. It looks like they have cycle beads for a standard days model. Um, but still, these methods are down here in tier three, and I think, you know, less effective. And so today I want to dive in, why are these methods in this box? And I want to go through each of, or not each of the methods, but several of the methods, um, explain the physiology behind them, how they work, and then talk a little bit more about what the evidence shows about their effectiveness, um, to hopefully just give you a broader understanding of, um, where these methods fall and where they should be included in discussions with women about their healthcare and their contraceptive options. Um, because knowledge is power and the more you know, knowledge a woman has um, to make the best decision for her, the better that decision is going to be for her. And so we owe it to all women to include this knowledge in these discussions so that they can truly make an informed decision of what is best for their bodies. Um, I do also want to bring up here um, that just, I've explained what I want to accomplish in this talk. I'm not going to spend much time at all in this talk talking about these other options of contraception um, and talk about the risk benefit side effects of them. We get a pretty comprehensive education of that as it is. And, um, you know, I'm not here to make a statement of FABMs are the best or the only option. Um, I just want to include the information behind them so that they can be an option and that you can all learn more about them um, in discussions of these other methods today. So 
a little background, like where did this data even come from? What, you know, with putting FABMs in tier three. And one of the main sources of data came from a 1995 survey, um, the National Survey of Family Growth. So this survey looked at women who became pregnant from the, between 1991 and 1994 and asked them to retrospectively remember what were you using at the time you became pregnant. Um, so this group of women who were using FABMs, quote unquote, uh, fell into the category of periodic abstinence. And that was found to have a failure rate of 22%. However, the issue with that is that um, 86 percent of the women who were using periodic abstinence were using an outdated calendar or rhythm method. Just 14 percent reported using a modern day fertility awareness method. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind um, and have that context in your head as you're looking at this chart. Um, so that was a main kind of when people say, um, you know, natural family planning is has a failure rate of like 22 or 23 um, percent. That originally started with this um, survey. And so I think it's just important to keep that in mind. Um, so as we move into talking more specifically about the methods, I wanna review some women's uh, menstrual physiology. So this is a chart that goes through the hormones, ovaries, endometrial lining and body temperature in a women's standard menstrual cycle. We can note here this cycle is 28 days. Um, something I just want to bring up about that is actually only about 12% of women have a standard 28 day or a standard 28 day cycle. So 12% out of 100, clearly not standard. Um, a lot, women are going to have the vast majority of women that you see as a physician and interact with every day will not have a 28 day cycle. And that is something that modern day FABMs can address and can work with, um, which is a benefit of them. So we'll start with the hormones. So the hypothalamus secretes gonadotropin-releasing hormone and acts on the pituitary. The pituitary secretes follicle-stimulating hormone. That acts at the um, ovaries and stimulates several follicles, which start to um, develop. They secrete estrogen as they're developing, and you can see this dotted line here is a rise in estrogen. As that estrogen rises, um, you know, the first day of the menstrual cycle is the period, the period ends. As estrogen rises, um, the endometrial lining becomes proliferative um, and builds up in preparation to receive a fertilized egg. Um, eventually, one dominant follicle is the only one who makes it through after the follicle stimulating hormone. And so much estrogen is secreted at one point, it reaches a threshold and that stimulates an LH surge from the pituitary gland. Once that LH surge acts at the ovary, the egg is released. And at that point, you enter your luteal phase or your second half of the cycle. What's left behind is the corpus luteum, which is a huge source of progesterone. So you see this rise in this light gray line of progesterone. Um, and progesterone does some um, interesting things in the second half of the menstrual cycle. One thing is it raises a woman's basal body temperature significantly um, and keeps it elevated until that progesterone declines and the next period begins. The second thing is it changes um, the endometrial lining to a more secretory endometrium in preparation for, um, or which is how it will be until it starts to shed with the progesterone withdrawal. And then lastly, which I didn't um, mention up to this point, but so estrogen more dominant in the first half of the cycle, the follicular phase, as you reach ovulation, progesterone more dominant in the second half, luteal phase. Um, estrogen and progesterone have very important effects at the cervix actually. And that's gonna lead us into a discussion about cervical mucus, um, also known as like physiologic um, cervical mucus or physiologic vaginal discharge. Um, the effect of estrogen at the cervix produces cervical mucus that is um, fertile type mucus. It's very nutritive to sperm. It creates um, the way that the molecules, the ions in the water interact. It creates channels through which the sperm can easily travel um, and sperm can survive in that fertile type cervical mucus for five days. Um, progesterone on the other hand acts at the cervix and um, produces a cervical mucus that is not, um, that's actually very hostile to sperm survival and uh, creates kind of a pattern that's pretty much impenetrable to sperm. And we'll talk a little bit more about the science behind that in a moment. Um, so I think that is everything about the menstrual cycle at this point. Um, just one egg is released every month and the egg has a lifespan of about 24 hours. And that I bring that up for this next slide because um, this study was done that showed that 
of 220 healthy women who were planning a pregnancy. Um, they recorded all days of intercourse and um, their days of, they took daily urinary, uh, urinary samples and their hormones were tested, um, estrogen and progesterone. The day of ovulation was determined by looking at those, that estrogen and progesterone in the urine. Um, and overall, 625 total cycles were recorded from these women with 192 conceptions happening. Um, all conceptions, um, all pregnancies happen in just a six day period. Um, five days before ovulation up to the day of ovulation. Those, there were no other pregnancies of any other days of intercourse for any of the women in any of these cycles. And that's based on what I just explained um, about how once a woman starts producing more fertile type cervical mucus, a sperm um, is able to survive in that um, for five days. But a woman can't have an egg fertilized until she releases that egg. So if you look here, like if a um, woman had intercourse on this day, negative five, and the sperm survived these five days to the day of ovulation, and a uh, um, fertilization could occur on that day. However, as soon as, you know, the day after ovulation comes, the egg lifespan runs out, the egg can no longer be fertilized, um, and fertility is over for that month. Um, so... That is kind of a basic background of the physiology of a woman's cycle and the, the background for these many of these methods and how they work. Um, so there are a lot of different types of FABMs. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are calendar met. There are still calendar methods. Um, it's not the rhythm method. Uh, there's, it's called the standard days method is a well studied um, method and it's pretty it's only is appropriate for women with a certain specific length menstrual cycle. So that's not going to be an option for all women who have like variable length. So for example, someone with PCOS, that would not be a good option for them. Um, then cervical mucus based methods. So there's the Billings ovulation method, which I'll talk about, Creighton model system. Um, Creighton model has an associated medical and sur uh, surgical protocol called nat natural procreative technology or NAPRO that I'll briefly uh, touch on. There's also the two days method. There's a symptothermal method, which is based on these biomarkers um, plus basal body temperature. There's basal body temperature only, which um, there's now an app called Natural Cycles, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then there's symptohormonal. So looking at cervical mucus with a urinary hormone um, fertility monitor. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, so first let's talk about cervical mucus. Um, this is, might be a Maybe you've never said that word out loud, or maybe it's kind of a taboo topic, but it's very fascinating. And there's really interesting research done starting as early as like the mid 1900s. Um, Dr. Eric Odeblad looked at cervical mucus under the microscope and did interesting, you know, NMR studies, looked at its, uh, looked at its stru the structure of the molecules within it um, at various points in women's cycles. So just going through, this is kind of the order going from this bottom left to upper left to upper right, back down to bottom right. That's kind of the um, progression through a woman's cycle. The early follicular phase, um, you see, you know, it's under the influence of progesterone. Then as that estrogen starts to rise, this is the late follicular phase. L-type mucus, um, it's kind of like the beginning of the fertile type mucus. There's still uh, not super straight channels and more like almost ferning appearance of these crystals, but um, it is more nutritive to sperm and sperm are able to survive. Um, then this high estrogen, this is mucus that's under the influence of the highest level of estrogen. Um, the molecules and the water form these channels as I you know talked briefly about. It's very nutritive for sperm and it's going to have like the, it's going to be noticeable for a woman. So it's going to be wet. It's going to be um, slippery. It's going to be clear. It's going to stretch farther than one inch. Um, and then once ovulation ends and progesterone rises, you see this G plus type mucus. Um, the S type mucus has, you know, low viscosity found on NMR studies and this G type or infertile mucus under the influence of progesterone has high viscosity. It's not um, good for sperm travel. It's not good for sperm survival. Um, it's very, sperm aren't, do not survive long in this mucus. And um, this studies, or these studies done by Dr. Odeblad really formed the basis of the Billings ovulation method. Um, I want to thank Dr. Thompson. She shared this slide with me. This is just an image of like, what does cervical mucus look like? This is physiologic. Um, this is not a sign of infection in a woman. So this is like infertile mucus. It doesn't stretch very far. It's dry, tacky, or thick. 
Um, this is also creamy, kind of sticky, doesn't stretch super far. A lot of the color, this cloudiness, um, again, women might think is infectious, but it's often just white blood cells or epi epithelial cells sloughing off um, in the cervical mucus. This is starting to get semi-fertile. There's an estrogen influence here. It's starting to stretch a little more. And then this is that peak fertility uh, type mucus. It's watery, it's stretchy, it's like crystal clear. It's described as an egg white mucus. Um, so let's talk about Billings first. So Billings is a cervical mucus method um, and it goes through, teaches a woman to identify the cervical mucus signs. Now, something about Billings is that it's fairly subjective. Um, the way it's taught is that you teach women to describe what she feels. So if she feels wet, she can describe the word wet and put that on her chart, um, et cetera. So after a few cycles of learning, well, actually, an interesting study by the World Health Organization showed that actually over 90% of women are able to identify the fertile window and their peak day in just one month of charting. But women gain more confidence after a few cycles, and these are the symbols that are used in the chart. So you see you use these red stamps for bleeding, green stamps for dry or infertile days, um, these little white baby stamps um, for signs of like that more fertile cervical mucus um, once you start entering your possible fertile or fertile window. Um, and then peak day, you count three days after the peak day um, to make sure that ovulation has definitely ended and the egg is gone. Um, and so here's like a full chart. So here's a brief menstrual cycle. She was dry. Um, this would have been a safe day for intercourse. She noticed a change. She described feeling wet on this day. So she put a white baby and abstained. But the next day she was back to dry. So she knew I'm not entering my fertile phase yet. Then she had another point of change and that lasted all the way through the peak day. This is the last day of that peak type mucus and then wait one, two, three days and then you're back in the clear to have intercourse for the rest of the cycle. If you are, it, this is all if you're trying to avoid pregnancy. Um, these are the four rules to avoid pregnancy. The early day rule one is avoid intercourse on days of heavy menstrual bleeding. The reasoning behind that is because women can have early ovulations. Um, and if you're having heavy menstrual bleeding, you might miss um, any cervical mucus that's coming through um, with that heavy bleeding. And so rather than miss that, you just abstain from um, sexual intercourse on those days. Um, early day rule two is that you can have intercourse on alternate alternating days during your basic and fertile pattern, which is this um, first, you know, after the period ends, but before your fertile window begins, um, women learn to identify their basic and fertile pattern. It's that time of dryness or maybe like really thick sticky mucus before they have a point of change and have that fertile window. Early day rule three is if you change from the basic and fertile pattern or change from BIP, wait and see. So she did that on this day. She was wet. She's not normally wet in her basic and fertile pattern. So she abstained, she waited and, and see, and the next day she was back to dry. And then peak rule, you have to wait until the fourth day post peak, and then it is okay to have intercourse anytime until the next period. And that's based on the fact that, um, Ovulation often happens on the peak day um, for like they've done studies about this and ovulation does mostly happen on the peak day, but it can happen even um, two, two days plus or minus that peak day identified by cervical mucus. So that's just to be totally safe in case ovulation were to happen two days past peak, you wait one additional day and then you're good to go. Um, and so here are just some studies about billing. So this is a major study done in India, over 2000 women for almost three years. Of note, uh, a third of the women were illiterate and only 7% could read and write. Um, and I bring that up because I think one concern about fertility awareness methods is that they're only applicable to very well-educated women or literate women. And um, this study proved that that is not the case. These women were able to learn this method and use it effectively. Um, this is a large scale study over 30,000 women months. Um, the pregnancies were categorized due to method failure, which would be like if the woman was using it perfectly and the method failed or user failure, which is imperfect or tip, more typical use. Um, there was a, so the method failure or perfect use had a 1.5 per 100 user failure rate and user failure or more typical use was 15.9. There was a statistically higher failure rate in those less than age 25 versus over age 25. However, no differences were seen based on educational status or number of living children. Um, in this study, women were not able allowed to use any like backup contraception. There was no condom use or anything during um, their times of intercourse. 
Um, also of note, continuation rate was high. It was 76 per 100 users at one year. Um, and so that does point to the acceptability of the method. There's another study done in China in more, a little more recently in 2000. It studied 1,654 healthy women who had been previously fertile. So they've been able to have a pregnancy before. 992 were assigned billings and 662 were given an IUD. They were followed for one year. The billings pregnancy rate was just 0.5% and the IUD rate was just 2%. Um, that was a statistically significant difference. There were five discontinuations in those using billings and those were due to those five pregnancies. In the IUD group, 65 discontinuations were noted um, due to 12 pregnancies, 15 expulsions and 38 removals due to um, side effects or the woman's preference. Um, so it was statistically, the, dif the difference in discontinuation rate was also statistically significant. Moving on to the Creighton model system, it's fairly similar to Billings. It's also a cervical mucus method and it's pretty, it's based on a lot of the same science as Billings. However, Creighton wanted to make a more, um, or Thomas Hildreth, who's one of the major developers of Creighton, wanted to create a system that was more objective and very standardized so that it could be generalizable, applicable to all women, um, easy to teach uh, and standardized to teach and easier to study. So it is very well studied and has an integrated medical protocol called NAPRO. Um, there is a research teaching, treatment, and training center at the Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. And like I said, there are surgical and medical fellowships in NAPRO technology. Most of the doctors who pursue those are OBGYNs or family medicine physicians. Um, so there's very, very standardized patient education um, in Creighton. You, if you choose to learn Creighton, you have to go through um, a standard a set of classes with a fertility care practitioner. They check in and ask you a lot of the same questions every month to make sure that, or every time you meet, to make sure that you are using the method effectively and following all the rules. Um, you're taught to make standard mucus checks and descriptions. So no subjective terms here. Um, there's very standardized descriptors of the mucus and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, you are to check every day before and after using the toilet every single time before and after showering and swimming. And there's four step or three steps to checking. First, as the woman wipes, she has to use a flat uh, tissue paper. She wipes from the vulvar area through the um, perineum. And that's because like the sensation of the perineum is very sensitive. And if she notes like a dry feeling or a lubricative feeling, those are important things to note because um, lubricative is um, alone is a reason to put that it's peak type mucus. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Then she looks at the tissue, observes um, for just the appearance. And if there's mucus, if there's the color, if there is mucus that's able to be picked up, she puts it in her fingers and does the finger test, check for the stretchability and the color while doing that. And in that slide, I had a few slides back. You could see, you know, her doing this is basically how you finger test. Um, and then she records that observation in her head um, or writes it down. Um, most women are able to just do it in their head and keep it in mind. And at the end of the day, you chart your most fertile sign of the day. Um, so peak type mucus when using Creighton is any mucus that is one inch or more stretchability or it's crystal clear um, or like has elements of uh, parts of it being crystal clear or is has a lubricative sensation. Um, peak day is the last day of any mucus that is peak type. So here is um, the standardized observation. So if a woman has bleeding, uh, she uses a red stamp. She records it as heavy, moderate, light, very light, which is spotting or brown or black. Um, and then her mucus recordings, um, zero is dry, two is, um, this is two and two W are like damp or um, wet, but no lubricative and nothing to pick up. And four is like the tissue looks shiny, but again, it wasn't lubricative and there's nothing to pick up. Those get a green stamp. Those are um, considered infertile. And then once you start having fertile type mucus, you uh, start using these white baby stickers, same as Billings. Um, six, eight, and 10 describe how far the mucus stretches. So a quarter inch, a half to um, 0.75 inches, and then one plus inch. Um, and the method is very, you know, you don't need to whip out a ruler to do these measurements. Um, you 
are able to do them without, you know, needing to make it exact. You, you learn over time, you know, um, what is one inch and greater. And then these last peak type mucuses are, um, if the tissue looks like damp, but it was lubricative, if the tissue looks shiny, but it was lubricative, or if the tissue looks wet and it was lubricative. Here's additional sensation um, descriptors and then colors that are put in the chart. So here is a Creighton model chart. Normal women, you know, the normal chart of a woman doesn't have these, this bar graph on it, but this was interesting. They studied the um, hormone levels in a woman every day of her cycle. Um, and you can correlate it with her signs of cervical mucus she recorded. So she had her period, she had this, you know, several days of dry with, you know, infertile, um, those would have been usable days for intercourse if she was trying to avoid pregnancy. Then she started having mucus observations. Now is as the estrogen, you know, or estradiol started to rise um, and then it started to fall. Her peak day was here. And after that peak day, you can see that progesterone as the luteal phase kicks off starts to rise um, and then fall. Um, and this is her, you know, luteal phase until the next cycle begins. Um, an interesting point about Creighton and something that is very useful about it is um, a woman really should have a pretty consistent luteal phase because that eight, the amount of time that the corpus luteum lasts each cycle should be pretty much consistent from cycle to cycle. It would be abnormal if it wasn't, and there would be a reason to get medical attention. So you can see here, her luteal phase was 13, 15, 14. Those are all within, you know, two days of each other. And that is normal. However, um, these cycles all have different lengths. And that means, you know, here was a standard, that perfect 28 day cycle. Here was an early ovulation. And so she recorded bleeding and then immediately went into her mu mucus pattern. So this is a great example of, um, you know, this woman would have been successfully able to avoid pregnancy by observing for that mucus pattern um, right away after the period. And she did have an early ovulation and then had a normal rest of the period. And then here had a delayed ovulation. There's some mucus patches. Maybe she had stress going on, something happened, but she did eventually ovulate and had a consistent luteal phase. Um, so she would be, by identifying the peak and then counting the days, she would be able to successfully predict the day of her next period, as well as not have anxiety about, am I pregnant? You know, why is my period late? Like in this last cycle, she would know, no, I had my peak on day 20. And so I'm expecting to get my period in the next, um, you know, 13, 14 days. Um, and then here's just a small example of some of the ways that Creighton can be used for medical care. Um, you know, here is an example of infertility. This woman's really not having much of a mucus cycle at all. And you need that good fertile type um, nutritive cervical mucus to allow the sperm to survive and make it to the egg and make a pregnancy. So um, this would be someone who, if they're trying to achieve pregnancy, would want to get worked up. Here, low progesterone, you have all these days of brown and um, spotting at the end of the cycle before the next cycle. Um, that can indicate low progesterone, which would be important, again, to address, especially if you are trying to achieve pregnancy, because progesterone is crucial to maintaining a pregnancy. And then here you have abnormal bleeding. Could this be a sign of fibroids? Could this be a sign of endometrial hyperplasia? It probably depends on the age of the patient, um, but good to note and be aware of. So the effectiveness of Creighton. Um, a 1998 study from the Journal of Reproductive Medicine did a meta-analysis, almost 2,000 couples with 17,000 couple months. Um, of note, the study included women of all different types of cycles, regular cycles, long cycles, breastfeeding women, weaning from breastfeeding women women who had been on the pill within the last year, people who've had abortions, people who were over age 40. And it found that the method effectiveness or perfect use was 99.5 per 100 couple years. And the use effectiveness or more typical use was 96.8 per 100 couple years. Additionally, Creighton is effective for infertility as well as that NAPRO technology. Um, Common NAPRO interventions for women who are trying to achieve pregnancy and who might be having trouble is once a doctor looks and analyzes their chart, they might decide, you know, we can induce or stimulate ovulation with Clomid. We can give you medications to enhance that cervical mucus. Um, vitamin B6 and even guaifenesin can thin the mucus and make it more um, profuse and um, better to help the sperm survive and make it to the egg. And then lastly, another big one is using bioidentical progesterone in the luteal phase. Um, here's a study done in Ireland in a family practice um, or family medicine practice of over a thousand couples trying to conceive for over five years. A third of them had previously attempted assistive reproductive technology, and these outcomes were measured live birth, 
um, conceptions and multiple births. And here's a life table analysis that was done. So the cumulative proportion of first live births was 52.8 per 100 couples. The crude proportion was 25.5 per 100 couples. There was no incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which was an important outcome because um, ART and stimulating the ovary to reduce or to produce several eggs and then retrieve them can cause ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and that can be life-threatening for a woman. Um, additionally, another important outcome was only 4.6% of live births were not singletons. That's another, you know, that was a statistically important difference from ART um, on comparison is ART does often result in multiple gestations, twins or triplets, and um, that can have, those are just higher risk pregnancies. It can have important outcomes for women. Um, the 88% of the births made it to term. Um, so overall, the results of pregnancy was, were comparable to ART. Um, there was a greater per cycle pregnancy rate with using NAPRO, um, but there were comparable cumulative rates of um, pregnancy and live birth. And then, uh, um, like I said, a lower rate of multiple gestations in the NAPRO group. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit to natural cycles. So natural cycles is a basal body temperature only method. Um, the way it works is every morning, as soon as you wake up to make sure you're really capturing that basal body temperature, um, a woman takes her temperature and logs it. A big difference with natural cycles um, is that instead of charting your cycle and having to keep the rules in mind and interpret your signs and apply the rules, natural cycles has an algorithm and spits out the answer to you. So it tells you fertile, not fertile, you can have sex today, you can't have sex today, you know, depending on your family planning intentions. Um, and so it's the first FDA approved birth control app that actually um, their algorithm has been cleared by the FDA and is now um, probably going to become much more prevalent. So I included some of these articles um, to show you like women are going to see this, it's in the news, um, they, very well might have questions for you, again, especially if you're going into primary care or OBGYN. Um, there's now another app, Clue, that's trying to get in on the FDA clearance with contra a contraceptive feature. Um, and Instagram influencers are um, advertising about natural cycles. And so that's another reason you might be asked about this. I saw this on social media. Can you tell me more about it? Is this actually effective? Um, natural cycles has a 93% typical use effectiveness and a 98% perfect use effectiveness. Um, that was a very large study that was done over 15,000 women um, with over 180,000 cycles analyzed. Um, so that data is based on um, a lot of cycles of data, uh, or those effectiveness rates are based on a lot of cycles of data. Um, and just one thing to note about natural cycles is this would not be a good method for someone who's like has a weird sleeping schedule like a nurse um, or someone else who works night shift and then switches because you need to be sleeping for at least four hours um, before you take your temperature to make sure your body truly establishes that um, resting basal body temperature additionally like illness, getting a fever, drinking alcohol, those things can affect your basal body temperature. So those are just some limitations of the method to keep in mind. And then moving on to Marquette. So Marquette um, Symptohormonal does cervical mucus observations and urinary testing, uses the Clear Blue Easy Fertility Monitor, um, which is interesting. You know, you might see this on the shelf and think it's just for women who are trying to achieve pregnancy, but um, Marquette has actually figured out how to use this device to um, incorporate it into their protocol to help women avoid pregnancy if that's their intention as well. Um, this monitor measures estrogen and LH. It gives you a reading of low, high, or peak fertility. Um, and in a 2003 study of 100 women for two to six cycles, the average first day of peak by the monitor was 16.5 versus a cervical mucus only group was 16.3. So that's interesting. You know, it gives you just about the same peak day, whether you're using cervical mucus or the monitor. However, the average length of the fertile phase with the monitor was 7.7 .7 days, which was um, statistically significantly lower than the cervical mucus only method, which was 10.9 days. So for women who are looking for maybe a more objective, um, you know, reading of your hormonal levels and um, maybe more usable days, if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, um, Marquette might be a great option for that. Um, 
So Marquette, here's an example of a chart, you know, the mucus observations, the clear blue, you have your days of low, high, and peak. And then again, there's a protocol for counting a certain number of days after peak until it's safe to have sexual intercourse again if you're trying to avoid pregnancy. Um, Marquette of note is um, cost associated with it. The monitor itself costs about 150 to 200 dollars, and that's like a one-time cost. But the test strips you do need to continually purchase, um, so it's about 30 to 50 dollars for 30 test strips each cycle, depending on your intentions and depending on your unique cycle. You might need 10 to 20 of those strips for every cycle. So that's just an ongoing cost to be aware of. Um, another perk of Marquette is that it's um, used a lot in breast uh, breastfeeding women because. Um, the cervical mucus uh, observations can become confusing after um, having a baby and then breastfeeding and then um, as your body starts to prepare to cycle again, um, but the hormonal uh, readings are more objective and can help women a lot with the breastfeeding phase. Um, another newer thing about Marquette is there was a recent study done about um, trying to make an online protocol for Marquette to make it more easy and accessible for women. And that was in response to this 2006 National Survey of Family Growth, which showed that just 0.1% of women in the United States of reproductive years are currently using modern FABMs. They said that they're ineffective, not easy to provide or use, health professionals are reluctant to recommend them, users are struggling with the periodic abstinence, having anxiety about unintended pregnancies. And those are all you know, real concerns that women have. So Marquette sought, um, this, the researchers sought, sought to develop an online program. They did this study in 2013 comparing an online protocol for Marquette um, for the monitor, the hormone monitor only versus the cervical mucus only method. Um, online instructions were given, quizzes were given for understanding. They were to avoid all intercourse and genital contact during the fertile window. The pregnancies were evaluated by an FABM um, nurse teacher. And overall, there were um, over 2,500 total cycles of use with over 1,500 cycles of like correct slash perfect use. So you can see here, the pregnancy rates per 100 women um, were 27.7 and 28.2 monitor versus cervical mucus only. However, perfect use with the monitor actually had a pregnancy rate of zero and the cervical mucus only had 2.7. Total unintended pregnancy rate was seven and 18.5. Um, and so that is all you know. I have to say about the methods. There are more studies. There's more information. There's more methods. Um, and this is just all I had time to do today as kind of a very quick overview of some of the methods and some of the science behind them. But next, I just want to talk a little bit about medical implications. Um, why the a woman's menstrual cycle is called uh, the fifth vital sign. You might have heard of that. Um, so having an awareness of your fertility and how your cycle goes really can have great benefits for a woman. Um, she can easily predict the next day of her next menstrual period, which um, is just good for quality of life. Um, FABMs do have no physical side effects. Now, again, that's not to say there aren't disadvantages or limitations, whether cost, whether anxiety, whether um, things like that. Um, so yeah, not to say there aren't limitations, but there are no physical side effects, which is not true of the hormonal methods of contraception. Um, and a very important one is it can reduce the time of your infertility workup from one year to six months. If you have a provider who's comfortable with FABMs and you are charting and you are using fertility focused intercourse and you have not conceived in six months, you can start your infertility workup at six months. Because if you know something's wrong and you can identify it, why wait a whole year? And so that can have really important implications for couples who are advancing in age and want to become pregnant. Um, additionally, charting can reveal if you're not ovulating, which it's not normal to not ovulate, especially if you're not using any sort of hormonal treatments. So could a woman have a pituitary adenoma and not be ovulating? Could she have relative energy deficiency um, in sport? which is formerly known as the female athlete triad. Could she have PCOS? All these medical conditions have important outcomes for a woman and can be revealed through the chart. Um, additionally, endometriosis, you know, there is a recent study that I found very interesting in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology that showed um, women who had a demonstrated consistent greater than or equal to two days of premenstrual spotting, that was actually a better predictor of ending up with histologically confirmed endometriosis than dysmenorrhea or dyspareunia, which are painful periods or painful sex. Um, and so, you know, endometriosis, this is a miniature soapbox, but endometriosis is like a, um, 
in this country, we have a huge delay to diagnosis. It ranges, you know, the it's cited at six to 10 years um, before a woman can get a diagnosis. And this is a, this disease has a huge impact on a woman's quality of life. Um, and, you know, just that example of that study, could FABMs um, and charting a woman's cycle have important implications for getting women faster and, you know, endometriosis diagnoses? Um, I think it's a great area for future research. And then, you know, charting and looking at basal body temperature or cervical mucus could reveal if you have low progesterone, if you have hypothyroidism. Um, and so, again, things that you would want to be treated for if they're revealed on your chart. Um, the last two things to say briefly is just, um, you know, other methods have typical use failure rates as well. As I'll talk about on the next slide, oral contraceptive pills have a typical use failure rate of 7%, which just I just bring up to indicate that, you know, women who are on the pill still might be, those women who are having that failure rate and getting pregnant um, are ovulating. They wouldn't have been pregnant if they didn't ovulate. Um, and so just being able to teach a woman about her fertile signs, even if you know, she decides that taking the pill or using the, the ring or something else is the right method for her, being able to give her that power and that knowledge of being able to say, oh, my, I'm feeling a wet sensation today, or I'm looking at the cervical mucus and it's clear and it's kind of stretchy and um, I'm detecting a change here. I wonder if I might be ovulating. That alone could have just power for her to take, um, take power of her own health and her decisions and her um, she could choose then to avoid sexual intercourse if she wants to avoid pregnancy and then seek help from her medical provider. And then lastly, just anecdotally, I've seen a lot of patients come into the ER and their PCP office with concerns about um, their cervical mucus. They're worried they have an STI. Um, they're worried about something going on and it's just physiologic cervical mucus. So again, there's just power in teaching women about um, their bodies and their health and what that this is normal. Um, and so just to end, you know, we're returning to this chart. I've overlaid the typical use um, failure rates for these other methods. And note here that the typical use failure rate cited by the CDC is anywhere from 2 to 23 um, for fertility awareness-based method methods. So I hope that this presentation has given you a greater context to think about these um, typical use failure rates and um, the science behind the methods. And, you know, I think it's interesting to ask if some of the methods have a 2% typical use failure rate, should they be up closer up here? Would that help people look at these methods differently? And should they even be parsed out? Um, and so I did parse them out a little bit. Um, there's billings, you know, a typical use failure rate of 10.5. There's another study that has a typical use failure rate of 22.5, which also contributes to this number. Um, Natural cycles, typical use failure rate of seven. Marquette, it ranges from two to eight. Um, we have Creighton model system about 3.2 and um, symptothermal is two. So I think that hopefully it just helps you give, get, have a better look at all these methods, all these options that are available to women and how we can give them better care, better knowledge of their bodies um, and teach them about their cycles and incorporate that into discussion so that they can truly make um, an informed decision about what is best for them. And also if they decide their family planning intentions are to achieve a pregnancy or to conceive, um, there's obviously so much knowledge, you know, and fertility awareness that can help them do that. So that is all I have. Um, and uh, I include this last slide if you want to learn more. I don't want to take, I want to leave time for questions. So the organization I'm involved with is called Facts About Fertility. And I would love to talk to anybody more about it. There's so much information on that website. They have an elective actually, which could be a great option, especially as we're still dealing with COVID. I took the elective and got credit for it for OSU. So um, happy to answer more questions about that, but I'm gonna go back to the QR code and that is all I've had for now. We have questions. Okay. So, Caitlin, excellent presentation. I don't know if, any, if any, the other people can see this. I'm going to read it. Um, As an OBGYN for over 40 years, I think we should be teaching young women about their cycles well before fertility is an issue or concern. A 10, 12, 14 year old young woman can be less fearful or confused about body changes if she understands normal, abnormal expectations and variations. Later in life, she can apply this information to her desire to achieve or avoid pregnancy. Pediatricians should also be included in your educational efforts. Um, let me see. 
Medicine is best when it is most diverse and offers evidence-based options for women that are consistent with their religious and cultural beliefs. Despite this mantra being promulgated throughout medical culture, it seems like there is a lot of open or subtle hostility towards FABMs, even though you are not suggesting it should supplant all family planning. Could you describe why you think this hostility is there, give an example of it in your own life and what you do to personally overcome this bias? Um, and then lastly, great presentation, Kate. I think you mentioned that swimming can confound using cervical mucus to detect the fertility window. Can you explain that again and discuss any other potential factors that you would counsel your patients on that can affect cervical mucus appearance and or consistency using Billings or Creighton? Those are great questions. Um, Bryce, how would you like me to handle the questions? So let's start with that first one. Um, I know you and I have talked about out this, um, about some of the hostility uh, with some of these other family planning methods that are not, you know, use of the pill or use of an IUD. So why don't we start with that one? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question. And I anecdotally, you know, have definitely <laughs> experienced, I'd say, bias or hostility towards these methods. I have my... Um, my involvement with facts on my resume and talked about it in my interviews this year. And to be totally honest with you, received in a lot of questions and I think a lot of bias about them. There was a lot of assumptions that um, just based on the questions I was asked in my interviews that because I know about these methods or promote these methods or like are interested in learning and research with these methods that I am not interested at all in the other methods or think they're bad. And so I think that's one element is that we just need to normalize this. Like I want to destigmatize the menstrual cycle. I want to destigmatize these discussions because um, you can, you know, we can be all inclusive here. We can talk about fertility awareness and we can talk about other methods for women. That's again, true informed consent. So um, I think that is an example in my own life. I've also seen with a patient who, um, when I was doing family medicine, um, we had a patient who had started, had came in with abnormal cycles, had started the pill. She came back to follow up like three months later. And the doctor was like, how's the pill, you know, how's it going? And she was like, oh, I took it. It worked. It was great. And then I was like, I told the attending, I said, I don't think she's still taking it. I think she stopped after one month. I think she thought she only needed it for one month. And then he went back to counselor about how she still needed to take it. And she started expressing, I don't want to take this every day. I don't want to take the pill. I do not want this. And he told her, you need this. It's the, if you want your cycles to be normal, otherwise they're not going to be normal. And all I wanted to do was just like bring this up, but I was a little bit limited. Um, I tried to ask him a question and he said, I said, could there be any room for hormonal testing for her if she's having abnormal cycles and doesn't want the pill? And he said, we know it's hormonal. That's why she's having abnormal cycles. And that's why the pill worked. And that was the end of the discussion. So that's just an example from my own life and my own medical education. And you know, I'm excited as I enter residency to be able to be a little bit more of an advocate um, in these ways, but I do encourage you all to learn more evidence and knowledge is power, as I've said. So that would be how I answer that first question. Um, and then next, so yeah, swimming um, can confound cervical mucus. So um, the instruction, again, like I don't, you know, know all this super, super nitty gritty specifics, but they do teach you what to do um, if you're a swimmer. I believe it's, um, you know, check before you swim, check as soon after you swim. Um, but they're pro I mean, that is a good thing to bring up and that might be not the best method for a woman, especially if she's like swimming all the time um, because the, mu the cervical mucus could potentially be, you know, washed away or wiped away and she could miss a recording. So there's, um, in Creighton, there are ways like, if you're worried that you missed a recording um, or missed an observation, you just have to consider that day fertile and count three days. And that's how Creighton, um, you know, addresses. Like if you, if you're just totally confused that day, or maybe you were sick and didn't get out of bed and didn't make any check, who knows, like for whatever reason, if you miss that day, Creighton teaches, consider that day fertile and then wait three more days. And so that is going to be a limitation for sure for some women, if um, that's really going to limit the number of usable days you have for intercourse, if you're trying to avoid pregnancy. Um, and then in terms of cervical mucus appearance and or consistency, I might, I'm gonna defer to Dr. Thompson um, about that if she knows anything from her own practice about various factors that can affect the appearance or consistency of cervical mucus. Okay, sure, yeah. So what do I see when I have patients that are asking me about um, 
you know, specifically swimming, it really, uh, that depends. And I do tell people, you know, if they're going to be in the pool a lot, or they're going to be using on um, mucus only methods, um, and they're swimming, they may consider what we call a cross check, because if you miss a mucus observation, you know, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? And how does that impact you? So um, the most conservative answer is always that if you miss a mucus observation, or you're unconfident in what you saw, then you would assume that you're fertile if you're going to over, avoid pregnancy um, or use a different method where it's relying on other things than just mucus alone. But when you're talking about, you know, what would you see to confound your mucus, mucus observations, certainly infection, um, anything that would typically change a discharge, um, yeast, bacterial vaginosis, those can kind of confuse the picture a lot. But for the most part, I would find actually what I found in my own practice is that women who are checking their mucus all the time are actually able to determine when there's truly something abnormal within their bodies. So I've not really honestly run into that very much at all. And about 50% of my practice, I would say, are FABM users. That's wonderful. Um, we have one last question that I'm going to pose to you, Kate. Um, do any of these methods include weight tracking as an, an additional data point for considering? That is a very interesting question. And to my knowledge, I don't believe any of the methods include weight tracking as a data point. Does Dr. Thompson have any? No, there are no methods that use weight tracking. No. All right. And that is all the time that we have today. Thank you all for uh, participating and uh, viewing this conversation. Thank you, uh, Kate. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for um, imparting this knowledge on us. A reminder that on April 6th, we'll be doing another a talk focused on women's health. Um, and Shannon Weber will be talking about the creation of the Women's Health Clinic at the Columbus Free Clinic Services. So I uh, hope that you uh, tune in for that um, and we will see you next time. Thank you all. Great job, Kate.